All right, so everybody online should be able to hear us now. Um, Jim, do you want to start off informally in here? Yeah, I thought I thought maybe since this is kind of one of our first uh, in-person uh, talks for quite a while, uh, and there are a few people in the room, uh, why don't we just sort of very quickly, if folks can just go around and identify yourself uh, and what organization you're from. Uh, James Carbo, I work at JGAPL. Um, I'm a cybersecurity engineer, uh, primarily working in space systems. I'm also a doctor of engineering student at JHU, and Jim's my advisor. So. Hi, everyone. I'm Tanner Gladson. I'm a senior undergraduate computer science major here at Hopkins. I'm, uh, I'm Ishmael. I'm an undergrad major here. Excuse me. Uh, Louis Wick, I'm uh, mechanical engineering, robotics. Ben Schmidt, IAA, external relations. Uh, each and one, uh, APL, and also affiliation with CS and IA. True. Uh, Pedro Sodas in the program language lab in computer science. I'm doing functional programming at the bit on the model check. Um, Earl Wu, I'm also in the same lab doing programming languages theory, um, mostly focusing on symbolic execution. Uh, here at Fazio from EC department. Uh, I work on neural network verification and robots. Great. Uh, Megan, we'll. Uh... Oh, hi, I'm Megan Mastola. I do communications for IAA. All right. Veronica, Cook, operations coordinator for the IAA. Yay. Okay, thank you all. Uh, so I'll just do some quick introductions. Can everyone hear me? Can uh, the folks online hear us? Yeah. I guess they can't really speak, so I'm going to say yes. Really speak, so yes. Okay, so uh, first of all, uh, welcome. This is uh, Grant Passmore. So Grant is, uh, is going gonna, is, is, uh, gonna to talk to us about formal methods in the uh, financial arena, particularly the financial arena. Uh, I was introduced to him by uh, one of the board of trustees, actually, for the applied physics lab. Actually, it was the chairman of the board of trustees. He said, trust me, this is a guy you want to meet. Uh, yeah, he's very interesting. And so we actually got a chance to meet in Houston, where uh, I finally got a little bit of a taste of, of exactly what's going on in this world where literally trillions of dollars are being passed around every day on the basis of very complicated algorithms that we all know could break. And so how the heck do you make sure that, first of all, that the trades occur as they should um, between the people who got in the system uh, in the queue where they should be first in the queue? And how do you make sure that nothing horrible goes wrong? Uh, it's, uh, it's kind of foundational and we sort of take it for granted. And there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes to, to, uh, to make sure that, uh, that this functions with some degree of assurance. So Dr. Passmore is co-founder and CEO of Amandra. Uh, he's a, a widely published researcher in formal verification and symbolic AI. And he has 15 years of industrial formal verification experience. So, so he's been a key contributor to safety verification of algorithms in Cambridge, Carnegie Mellon, Edinburgh, uh, Microsoft Research, and, and SRI. Uh, and he got his uh, PhD in automated theorem proving in algebraic geometry at the University of Edinburgh. As I found over breakfast, uh, I find myself in deep waters quickly when talking mathematics <laughs> with him. Uh, he's a graduate of UT Austin and the Mathematical Research Institute in the Netherlands and is a life member of Clare Hall University of Cambridge. So today, over to you. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you, Jim yeah. and Veronica and everyone for having me and attending. Let me do the one uh, non true oh. Keep your video muted. This time it's muted, actually. Oh, here we go. Better? Sorry. <laughs> we should still be able to hear it. Okay, good. Oh, and it looks like I'm optimized for screen share. Okay, so hopefully this is going to work. You see my screen? Yeah, do you yes. want to make it full? Yes. Okay. Well, thanks to your trusty guidance. I think we're in business. Hopefully you can read this. So today I'm going to talk to you, as, as Jim, uh, Jim described, about formal verification of financial infrastructure. And I'm focusing on this for a number of reasons. Uh, one, it is, um, I think, just utterly fascinating, the complexity and verification and you know, robustness challenges that we have at this uh, really core bedrock of our, of our nation's economy. And, so I'll talk to you about how you know, we can apply modern techniques from the formal verification and um, safety of algorithms world uh, to financial markets and, and what's being done currently and what isn't being done but should be done and so on. 
So first is, you know, really because I think this is such an interesting and important domain, but also at the same time, I think for the, from the perspective of the Institute of uh, Assured Autonomy, there are so many analogies between what's happening in finance uh, and what also needs to happen for safe robotics or, you know, safe autonomous vehicles, many other areas. And so hopefully as I go through, I'm going to try to really make a lot of this stuff in finance pretty concrete. Um, but hopefully as we go through it, these analogies will be clear, and, you know, please chime in if you want to talk about any of them. And uh, many, many of the examples I'll show, you know, we have the same kind of example you can go to on our docs page for, you know, robotic controllers developed in Ross. It's the same kind of thing we do to, to analyze a, a financial market. But okay, so I'm going to start with a, a little two minute explainer video. And this is really for uh, a very different audience. This is something we found early on. You know, we uh, you know, maybe I'll tell you a little backstory. So I, I did my PhD in formal verification, um, symbolic AI, and at the time there was a new kind of um, constraint solving and automated theorem proving that had that was really starting to be applied industrially. Something called SMT solving, which you may have heard of. And at the time, really SMT scaled to Nonlinear, I'm mean, sorry, to linear uh, programs. And I don't mean they're linear programs as in linear programming. I mean algorithms that do just linear arithmetic in their, in their operations. And so my PhD was on how do we link this to nonlinear your programs that have nonlinear behavior. And I did that originally in the, the context of an SMT solver called C3 or Z3 out of Microsoft Research that was being um, used at the time, among other things, for. Uh, analyzing safety of device drivers for, for Windows. So this was in the context of the transition from Windows Vista to Windows 7, remembers this. But basically, which is, you know, needed a lot of help. Um, then uh, we started applying these techniques to safety of autonomous vehicle controllers. The big idea being we want to, you know, take the design of a controller for, you know, collision avoidance and be able to analyze its possible behaviors, possible failures in advance of its deployment. And to do that, you need to reason about a lot of nonlinear behavior. So you're doing that originally. I then moved down as a postdoc to Cambridge and my best friend from undergrad, so any undergrads in the audience, I can recommend you know, nurturing your, your undergrad friendships that did well for me. My best friend, uh, Dennis, had uh, gone on at the same time and he was um, running a large trading desk at Deutsche Bank. In London, you know, hundreds of billions of euros of exposure every day, a huge MATLAB frame, 24 developers, five time zones. All, oh, did you say a huge MATLAB brain? A huge MATLAB brain, effectively running this high frequency trading system. Oh my God, Gary. So, <laughs> so, so something we're, we're all familiar with and also, yeah. you know, all uh, yeah. scared of, exactly. <laughs> Always worried about edge cases. Somebody going to commit a line of code that causes the system to violate a regulation, brings the house down various ways. And we realized the same thing we were working on for analyzing, you know, nonlinear controllers. We could actually, if you sort of step back, look at modern financial algorithms, what is a modern trading algorithm if not a form of an autopilot system? You know, there's so much in common. So we set out, founded the company to bring these new techniques for analyzing algorithms with nonlinear behavior um, to financial markets. And at the time, uh, you know, we would walk into a sales pitch to a bank or to a regulator and nobody had heard of formal methods and looked at us like we were crazy and you can prove theorems about your algorithms, get out of here, what does that mean? Um, no way that's practical. And anyways, it turned out to be very important to have a, a nice two minute video with a lot of visuals that it kind of explained the big picture that radically changed the tenor of our conversations. So I wanna show you that just so you sort of see the way we position this. And obviously, um, I think the audio is gonna work for them, but maybe not. So just, so okay. you know, it's working for them. We'll just have to use our imagination. Oh, really? <laughs> Um, I can try to turn it on from here and see if it doesn't interact, but okay. Yours will be your back. So, is yeah. there? Oh, yeah, my microphone's muted. I wonder. If, can we mute the room's microphone? Would that work? Well, why don't you try it and just okay, we'll just see. Yeah. 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 So wait, Electronic financial market. What's plaguing today's electronic financial markets? The world economy is built on a staggeringly complex tangle of algorithms. 
competitive pressures, and economic recession have contributed to increasingly opaque and unstable markets. The effects of glitches and unfair advantages can be devastating, cratering the confidence of investors and ultimately hurting the general public. Regulators and the industry have worked tirelessly to define what safe and fair markets are. What's been missing is a way to analyze and regulate all of the algorithms underlying them. The solution is formal verification, the science of correct algorithms. Other safety critical industries already rely on formal verification to make their algorithms safe. Amandra, by Aesthetic Integration, is the world's first formal verification solution for financial markets. Consider the building of a bridge. A design flaw may be catastrophic. To make it safe, engineers use powerful computer-aided design tools which analyze designs for safety automatically. Powered by latest advances in artificial intelligence, computer science, and mathematics, Amandra brings unprecedented rigor to the electronic financial markets, analyzing the safety and fairness of algorithms before they're deployed. Financial algorithms are unfathomably complex. They can be in a virtually infinite number of possible states, examining 100, 1,000 or even 100,000 test cases isn't enough. We must consider every possible case to answer definitively. What can possibly go wrong? Amandra allows designers and regulators to fix breaches of safety and fairness before they affect markets. Let's build safer, more reliable and regulatory compliant systems that all of us can trust, saving everyone time and money. Amandra by Aesthetic Integration the logic of financial risk. That is our It's 10 p.m. Do you know where your children are? <laughs> okay. All right. So here's the problem. Uh, financial markets have become notoriously unstable. You have flash crashes, you know, which are systemic events characterized by typically non-trivial codependence uh, between trading algorithms. One of the most famous is uh, May of 2010, drop of one trillion in U.S. equities markets, but these are not rare. And small versions of flash crashes that really happen all the time. Lack of transparency. So this, I don't know if anyone here read Flash Boys. Michael, this is an interesting, oh, yeah. yeah, Michael Lewis book, 2015, um, tells the story of the uh, protagonist IEX exchange, huh. which is effectively trying to address many of these issues. Um, but still, this is really uh, endemic in financial markets. You have extremely complex systems, the exchanges, um, the systems, what are called smart order routers, which we'll talk about, that connect people to many exchanges. And the way it's very interesting, these are legally required to have their possible behaviors described really to a quite a high level. But of course, who can go through a 500 page document and understand what it's saying? And our regulator is really able to actually analyze that and make sure that uh, it's saying things that are true. And the answer is, you know, without um, computer assistance, of course, no. And, and we argue that formal verification is really necessary. So this, this lack of transparency can lead to, you know, many issues of unfairness. If you have information asymmetry in a market where you know, one client knows how to use a special part of the API that others don't know about. And if they just set one parameter, well, it allows them to jump higher in the queue, for example, that's fundamentally unfair. And, um, you know, that, that absolutely needs to be addressed. People should have an equal playing field. The documentation should be correct, should be easily digestible, and nobody should know something that, that others don't. And finally, we have the sort of catch-all uh, bucket here of glitches. And, you know, this could be anything. You see it in the news all the time. There's a glitch at London Stock Exchange, and the equities trading has been halted. You know, glitch at NASDAQ, and, um, you know, all sorts of crazy things go into that bucket. Goldman Sachs alphabet trading glitch, if anybody heard of this, where based upon the first character and the symbol name um, of a stock being traded, you could get radically different behavior. And uh, similarly, my capital loss of $400 million in about 30 seconds. And, you know, what's the source of that glitch? Well, problem dealing with transitioning between two modes of the venue that ultimately goes down to uh, misusing a linked list data structure. You know, so these, these glitches are, are common and, and there's a, a wide array of them. Oh, actually, so. 
So I have some goals for the talk, and these are lofty, but um, you know, it would be great if you leave this talk uh, being having a good idea of these concepts in finance, what a venue is, an exchange, a dark pool, order book, order types, matching logic, all of these go together to, to comprise what's called the market microstructure uh, of a market and a smart order router. And so we'll, we'll go through these uh, concretely and then I'll point you to places where, where you can go to our system in Mandra, you know, spin up a Jupyter notebook and analyze some of these things for public markets. Um, regulations, so you know, talked a little bit about transparency. There are key safety and fairness regulations, one called Reg ATSM, another around something called best executions called Reg NMS. Obviously, we're not going to be able to go too much into detail on these, but I want you to know the names and to have a big idea of the kinds of things these regulations are addressing. And finally, this is uh, the most lofty goal, but uh, with pointers to documentation, you should be able to, if, you're, if you so desire, to go write a spec and analyze basic regulatory properties of a, of a trading venue and substitute trading venue for robotic controller if you want or um, analyze properties of classifier or whatever. I'll point you to, to basic ways you can use our, our formal verification system in Mindra to do these things. Okay, some of the core intuitions. So, so I heard a few of you say that you're actually doing formal verification symbolic execution. Um, Anybody else in the room? Is this a familiar concept? Over okay. So the big idea is, you know, we're all familiar with software testing, right? Software testing is you have a piece of software, you have some requirements, and these may be very local, you know, so-called unit test-like requirements that you know uh, something always uh, whatever returns a sorted output. Um, it may be something global about how the whole system with many components operates. And classically in software testing, what do you do? Well, you write a bunch of tests and you hope that your tests are exercising the system in enough you know, modes of behavior, enough regions of the state space to gain some assurance that, that your system is correct. But of course, as our systems become you know, complex enough, which certainly financial algorithms are, certainly things like robotic controllers are, uh, you can only test a very small number of cases. And the state space of your system is either infinite or virtually infinite, right? In general, if you think about this as, a, as an abstract algorithm. So testing is not enough. And the idea of formal verification is, well, that algorithm itself, that actually is a mathematical artifact. You know, just as a uh, geometrical object, you know, is a mathematical artifact, topological space is a mathematical artifact, a given algorithm is a mathematical artifact. So you can actually prove theorems about its possible behavior. Uh, and proof theorems about all possible cases can behave, as opposed to just testing a finite number of cases. That's the big idea. We're, we're shifting from testing to proving. And then, of course, the, the name of the game is, first of all, specifying the properties you care about, being able to figure out what those are and write them down in a completely precise way so that this kind of analysis can occur. And there's all sorts of problems there where you prove the wrong thing. Well, great, you know, your system is still not going to do what you want. Um, so, so getting the spec right is very hard and very important. And then, of course, having automation to help you do that proving. And classically, uh, you know, it's, it's, this has been one of the holy grails of computer science, proving theorems about programs you know, since the, the advent of computer science going back to Gertle and Turing. Um, but ultimately, what has made this much more practical over the past decade are fundamental advances in proof automation. So that you know, mainstream software developer engineers who don't have a background in formal verification, don't know what a proof by induction is, for example, um, can have a tool where they take their algorithm, take a property they care about and push a button and get out either a proof or a counterexample. There's fundamental limitations, uh, you know, going back to mathematical logic on what can be done automatically. You can't do everything um, automatically, but you know, to make this stuff practical, uh, we have this sort of uh, envelope of things that we can do automatically that we're constantly pushing. And that's, that's what we do uh, in a monitor, and I'll show you some examples. But the idea is to take you know, uh, fundamental advances in automation to make formal verification mainstream, give people tools to analyze their programs for a wide array of properties that they, they really care about and make it as push button as possible. And the flip side of, 
you know, this whole process is really most of the time you're analyzing a piece of software and you think it's, it, you know, it should do something. Uh, most of the time you're, you're wrong. <laughs> most of the time there are edge cases where it does the wrong thing and being able to extract out counterexamples, inputs into your system that cause it to do something that violates a requirement, that's critical. And that's, that's something that I'll show you. It's really fundamental to everything we're doing. Okay, so one of the places formal verification has classically been applied is in hardware verification. And I'll tell you in a minute a story about that going back to Intel in the 90s. But there in hardware, you have this notion of an instruction set architecture, an ISA. Every chip has an ISA. And um, when you're verifying hardware designs, what you're doing is you're proving that this ISA really does what it says on the tin. You know, if the manual says this floating point division operator really meets the IEEE floating point semantics, well, you want to prove that that's the case. And uh, you, can, you can have designs that pass, you know, hundreds of millions of test vectors uh, that still, uh, when they, you know, in the wild, there are edge cases where floating point division is wrong, for example. Now, that, that's part of the Intel story. Okay, so one of the intuitions I want you to have here is that in finance, the venue matching logics, which are the collection of order types at a trading venue, things like limit orders, market orders, we'll talk about these in more detail. These are like the ISA, the instruction set architecture of the market, sort of giving you a processor with a bunch of possible instructions you can use to package up risk. So we can adapt a lot of techniques that have worked in hardware verification to the case of analyzing markets. And then also, you know, I hope you leave this talk with, with a belief that there's a pressing need for trading venues. It's really shared market infrastructure that everybody relies on. The bulletproof with respect to safety and fairness regulations or matching logics, which are the, in a sense, the, all the possible ways those systems can operate to be formally described to regulators and market participants for them to be formally analyzed with precise encodings of regulatory directives. And uh, for new financial mathematics, the kind that regulators use to devise regulations, really new financial mathematics should be developed that takes these precise formal models of these systems into account. Um, there's far too much idealization classically happening in the mathematics that drives uh, the introduction of regulations. And uh, the difference between the idealized systems and the real systems is, is outrageous. Okay. So what's motivating all of this and motivating the, you know, let's say the mainstream adoption of formal verification is just that software has become too complex, right? We're really past the cognitive limit of software development where humans have all of the possible behaviors of the piece of software in their head, um, especially for these, you know, complex, huge pieces of shared infrastructure. You, you, the state spaces are just so large, you have to have mechanized assistance. And, and this is, of course, not unique to finance. You know, you have the same thing, autonomous vehicles, robotics, um, you know, the, the list goes on. Okay, so one class of systems that I mentioned, hardware, where formal verification has really become uh, foundational, um, there's a great story that, that, you know, motivates this. Uh, and the result is, you know, we very rarely these days hear about problems in chip designs. It, it happens, uh, but it's, it's extremely rare, especially given the exponential growth and the complexity of these systems. And just to compress the story, you know, uh, a bit apocryphally, but very quickly, how many of you remember the original Pentium in 1994? So you probably remember the, the recall. So basically, Intel released their first Pentium uh, after you know, an immense amount of testing, but this is really in the pre-formal verification world. Uh, and it had a bug in its floating point division instruction. So tested on you know, 60 million plus test vectors, look great, let's go fabricate the chip. And in the wild, uh, all of a sudden, the division of two floating point numbers gets wrong results. That's a fundamental instruction you need in scientific computing. That's bad. So they, uh, at the time, had to recall the first Pentium. That was, I think, around $475 million uh, in 1994 dollars. And effectively, you know, the design of uh, a floating point, it's so complex because to, to make it high performance, you have complex microcode that's exploiting a lot of number theory. Um, you know, uh, trying to do these kinds of operations in as few cycles as possible. And you know, it is not straightforward to look at that microcode and say, oh, this is doing the right thing. 
So AMD were at the time in Austin, Texas, coming onto the scene with their first x86 competitive chip, the K5, and they realized it'd be very easy for us to have a bug in our floating point unit, similar to Intel's. We also have this very complex microcode. But if AMD were to have a similar issue post-fabrication, you know, they would be dead in the water. Totally different capitalization. So they were pioneers. They hired two uh, mathematicians, computer scientists at UT Austin, Boyer and Moore, who were some of the greats of formal verification, hired them to come in and not just test their system, but build a formal mathematical model of the actual microcode that's used in the design and prove for every possible input into the system it obeys the floating point semantics. Prove that it's correct. You can't exhaustively test the state space. You have to prove it. And uh, to do that, of course, you have to reason symbolically. You, you're not considering concrete executions. You're considering symbolic executions and, and proving that the symbolically the results are always correct. So in the process, they found a number of bugs very similar to Intel's but they were able to work with designers at the time over about six weeks to patch the design, prove the resulting design correct. And that's what AMD went to fabrication with, the great success. And that's widely seen in the in our hardware as how AMD gained a foothold against Intel when Intel was peak. Huh. And ever since that, you know, formal methods are just foundational to hardware. So you have a whole niche now, so-called EDA, electronic, electronic design automation, that are companies like Synopsys and Cadence, for example, uh, their whole you know, value prop is automated theorem proving for proving typically equivalence of hardware designs. And so often there, you will have um, a very easy to understand version that you can see as being a sort of executable spec, and you'll have the high performance implementation. And what you're doing is establishing that they have the same extensional behavior. You give them either one an input, it will give you the same output, even though it's computed in a very different way. Um, okay, so that's, that's hardware. <laughs> and the big idea, the, the dream here that fuels what we're doing and, and many others in this world is to bring these same advances to software. Software operates at a very different, you know, very different levels of abstraction. Uh, in hardware, you're dealing with Boolean logic, you're dealing with circuits. In hardware, well, you know, to operate at the level of a software developer, you've got complex data structures, you've got lists, you've got trees, you've got recursion, you've got loops. And it's, it's all uh, effectively at a much higher level that gets much closer to what we think of as being sort of classical discrete mathematics, proving theorems by induction and so on, than the hardware world. Uh, but what's made things scale in hardware, um, among other things, fundamental advances in what's called SAP solving, <laughs> satisfiability solving, we can leverage that in the software world. So basically, you know, hardware, you know, we're talking here about discrete hardware, um, this Boolean logic is, is totally discrete, uh, but it's enormous. And this deciding equivalence of these Boolean circuits, that's a you know, classical NP-complete problem. Yet you can now use these SAT solvers to scale to designs with millions of variables, right? How can you do that? If you think about the truth table, right? Possible rows, you've got exponential, you know, your exponential and the number of variables. So how do you do that? That's been major advances in search strategies, something called conflict-driven clause learning um, that allow SAT solvers to handle these enormous designs. And when we go to the software world, we can take advantage of that. So that's one of the ideas of this s and um, approach. s and stands for satisfiability modulo theories. You use the core technique of SAT solving that has allowed uh, analysis of hardware designs to scale to enormous state spaces that are, that are discrete and you marry that together with uh, decision procedures that can operate at the level of a program. So you have decision procedures for analyzing algebraic data structures like linked lists and trees, decision procedures for linear arithmetic over integers, decision procedures for arrays. You're bringing those together with the core handling of the case splitting that comes from things like you know, if then else statements. Um, you're handling that with the techniques from hardware verification and bringing in these new techniques to handle the higher levels of abstraction of software. Okay, so, so we want to have all of that, um, you know, and, and bring in and make it accessible for, for software developers. And the value proposition, as you can imagine, you know, lower costs and risks, really shifting left, bringing, um, you know, assurance to the design phase before you allow things to be deployed. This really does lead to, you know, radical reduction in time to market, 
We've got examples in finance where you know our tagline is from five months to five days, for example, for a major uh, investment bank and stock exchange to onboard new clients, because we're not doing this classical you know throwing darts in the dark testing of a finite number of cases of an infinite state space. We're actually verifying all possible interactions in advance, finding typically flaws, helping clients figure out what those are, fix them, and prove the resulting connection or design correct and go live. Um, and of course, allows us to enforce complex regulations, have proper governance and explainability and the other things. Okay, so what is Imandra? Um, Imandra uh, is our formal verification system. And we it has a lot of unique design decisions um, that really are motivated by trying to bring these techniques to mainstream software developers you know, who don't know what a rewrite rule is or an induction principle. So at the core, Imandra is a programming language. So at the lowest level, you have a program and uh, it, the sort of machine language for us is a language called OCaml. So at the lowest level, we have programs expressed in a functional language called OCaml. And then we have a lot of higher level tools for translating other algorithms into that. But basically, you have your code at the lowest level expressed as OCaml, then you express properties about that code. You write those properties also as programs. They're just Boolean value programs that could evaluate to true or false. And then when it comes to verifying the properties of your code, what you're asking a margin to do is to verify that always those properties will evaluate to true. And if ever they, if that's not the case, then you want a margin to synthesize a counterexample. So all of that is happening by a mathematical logic. It's based on a formal semantics we give to the subset of OCaml. And then that's automated using our reasoning engine. And there's a, a bunch of, if you're familiar with formal verification, a bunch of things here that are, you know, really specialized design decisions to make this stuff accessible. One of the most important is what we call first class counterexamples. And that is, if you have a conjecture about your program and it's false, your program may be a very complex artifact. That counterexample itself may be a very complex artifact that needs to run through your system. So in a mantra, when you get a counterexample, that's a first class object that's available in the same programming environment as your mathematical model of your system. So you can just run it through your system and see where things went wrong. And that's, you know, it's kind of crazy to think that's not a, a you know, property typical of um, formal verification systems, but, but it's not. It's much more in a sense, you can think about it kind of like a computer algebra system specialized to algorithms. Um, then it has a lot of proof techniques that are really specialized to decomposing the state spaces of systems in a precise way, uh, allowing you to localize a flaw to a region of behavior to get an understandable description of where it's coming from. So just to say, if anybody's interested, you can go to our website, go to try.imandra.ai, which you can go directly or click on from, from our main page, and you can then have Imandra in your browser. And there's lots of examples, there's a gallery, you know, from neural network verification to exchange verification, which I'll show you, um, you know, autonomous feedback analysis, kind of the, the sky's the limit. Um, and then you can install also a mantra uh, locally if you want. Okay, so I'm going to tell you now, um, just a high level, uh, but enough hopefully to, to meet those goals about what this stuff looks like in finance. And if you want to know more, we have a paper, Formal Verification of Financial Algorithms. It goes into to many more details. Um, and you can write me if you, if you want a copy or find it online. But core to all of this is the, I uh, can't read this here, but it says stack of financial algorithms, is really um, a view of modern finance as being this hierarchy of complex algorithms that are interacting. And we arrange that uh, typically in what we call the stack of financial algorithms. And the idea of this stack, you have the same point of view if you're you know, verifying a, an operating system, for example. The idea is you have a stack of abstractions where you know, an operating system is, if you want to verify a property of an operating system, well, you need to understand uh, not only its high-level concepts, but also how those high-level concepts translate into instructions uh, for the hardware that it's running on. And if you want to understand, of course, um, you know, how those instructions operate, you need to have a formal model of that ISA for the hardware. So it's a, it's a stack where you basically have, as you go from the bottom to the top, increasing levels of abstraction that are relying on properties of the subsystems below. And at the lowest level, you have trading venues. 
So these are things like New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, uh, London Stock Exchange, and so on. And uh, these provide um, basically what are called order books, which are for every security like Microsoft, you know, collections of buy and sell orders that clients submit. And then the venue is responsible for matching those orders, figuring out at what price they should match while abiding by all sorts of safety and fairness regulations. On top of those venues, you have these things called smart order routers. So a smart order router, that's a system that, you know, you may be a, a trading desk and we're all familiar with those big names I mentioned of trading venues. You'd probably be shocked to know there's, last I checked, 65 regulated trading, regulated trading venues in the US alone. There's hundreds globally, maybe even thousands at this point. And so Smart Order Router, it's connecting to many of these different venues, you know, often a few hundred venues. And the goal of a Smart Order Router is, you know, if I uh, want to buy 100,000 shares of Microsoft, if I just send that to a single stock exchange, that's going to have huge market impact. People will see that those are my intentions. They're going to drive the price up. Um, you want to, you know, keep your cards close. Nothing unethical about that. Uh, but you want a system that, you know, is helping you achieve your goals while minimizing effectively the adverse behavior against your moves. Um, and you want also to route orders to places where you think they're likely to be filled. So Smart Order Router, it's connecting to, you know, let's say 200 different venues. It's maintaining a view of those systems, trying and, you know, I think a lot of problems related to robotics, trying in a way to to have a view of its state, the state of those systems and the likelihood that you're gonna get good behavior from them, and then chunk up your big order into a bunch of little pieces, strategically send it out to all of those different venues, try to get the results filled while minimizing market impact and so on. And there's a ton of uh, regulations around that, so-called best execution regulations. So even though you know a system is trying to be smart, so-called smart order router, it better not do something that's stupid. It better not do something that gives you know, a client worse behavior than if it had done something you know, very naive, seemingly naive. There are all sorts of regulations around that. Then as we go up the stack, we've got so-called trading algorithms. So these are where, you know, if you have a view of Wall Street, you know, where a, a physicist has a, an idea of how swarms of ants behavior can be used to get alpha and have a new kind of trading algorithm that's going to make money. That is happening here, really at the trading algo level. And as we go up this stack, again, you've got you know, all of these higher level systems that are relying on um, the lower level systems and have abstractions of them. If those abstractions are wrong, you know, that's, that's bad. And as you go up this stack, you really have something super high frequency at the venue level. Uh, and as we go up, we're becoming lower and lower frequency. So, you know, at the level of collateral trading, that may be something that is reconciled, you know, every 72 hours. Whereas here, this stuff is at the microsecond level. And of course, collateral trading ultimately submits its intentions down the stack and venues are operating on, on what collateral trading wants to do. Um, but the timeframes, you know, uh, change dramatically. And here at the venue level, really the logic is discrete. I mean, you have ostensibly what we think of as, uh, you know, real number prices, but they're not. The prices are actually over discrete number systems because you have limitation on the tick size. Uh, and basically you're, you're highly nonlinear, but, you know, the kind of mathematics you're used to when you think about financial mathematics, that really comes up here. So at the trading algo level, you know, that's where somebody's using Edo integrals, stochastic calculus, they've got machine learning, doing all sorts of stuff to try to get an edge. But this still has to take all of its, you know, brilliance, serialize that down to a bunch of instructions that are going to these processors, which are the venues. And ultimately, you know, big message here is if you want to verify a property about how a trading algo works, well, to verify that it's doing the right thing, you have to have, a, you know, an understanding of how the smart order route it's sending its orders to works. And to then reason about how that smart order router works, well, you have to have mathematical models of all the different venues it's connecting to. So you quickly get, if you want to do something up here, you quickly get forced to be absolutely precise about how these lower level subsystems are operating. And that's really how we got into this business in a way. We started here 
thinking, you know, wouldn't it be great to, to prove that investment banks trading algorithms aren't going to do certain bad things? But you can't do that unless you know how these systems work, unless you know how these systems work. There's even a lower level called connectivity, which is the communication protocol used to connect all these systems. There's a zoo there of, of verification need, and you have the same problem. Okay, so hopefully this is just giving you a bit of an intuition of the landscape. And so we've talked about venues. In what is a venue? Well, you know, we know the big ones, London Stock Exchange, New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, and so on. But uh, you may not have heard of these. <laughs> and the list keeps going. So basically, these are all different exchanges, and there's many more. And we call these lit liquidity because the, the, the markets are public. You can see what's going on. And these systems here, these, this is so-called dark liquidity. And these are things that are happening inside of banks. So the big idea, this is where so-called dark pools happen. Big idea is you have more or less the same kind of system as an exchange, but instead of being a public thing, it's operating inside of a bank. And the idea itself is not crazy. You know, if you're Goldman Sachs, you have clients who want to buy Microsoft, you have clients who want to sell Microsoft, but you could just match them internally without going to the external markets, minimize market impact and fees and so on. And so that's how this has, has really come about. But um, you'll see it has led to, to fundamental issues, much less transparent. Okay, so what does a venue do? Maintains an order book, processes incoming orders, matches orders, and it needs to do that all according to a precise spec while obeying many complex regulations. One of the most fundamental things, this is you think about an order book looking like this, it's got buys and sells, what are called bids and offers, and those are just lists of orders. But one of the most fundamental things that happens is that each discrete time step, the book is sorted. So uh, effectively, that's where a lot of unfairness can take place. And uh, if you know, the, if you are have an order here, it's only once you have um, risen to the top that you have the ability to trade. So that sorting, whatever your sorting uh, you know metric is, your relation there that's used to sort orders. That's a fundamental place that things can be gained because if you, you know, are able to exploit some special collection of parameters or some sequence of messages to get your order ranked above others so you can trade more quickly, well, you know, then all bets are off when it, when it comes to actually maintaining a fair market. So the, the intuition is something called price time priority, and that is lexicographic order where you know, you, you're ranked above others if you're more aggressive on price, uh, or if you have the same price level, you're ranked according to who was there first. But in practice, uh, it's much more complicated. So orders, uh, these are you know, really instructions to buy or sell a given security in a specified way, subject to constraints. They've really, over the years, become a programming language. You, know, you can say, like, buy 100 shares of Microsoft, with price at most $50, that's a so-called limit order. You can just say buy 100 shares of Microsoft at whatever price you give me, that's market order, the most aggressive. But this is you know, showing you a, just an order data type, a real one at a trading video. You've got a ton of, of parameters here. Uh, the notion of pegging, where you can have a prevailing market price that's coming as data feed. You can peg to that basically and have your prices be relative to it. You've now got a huge slew of order types. This one's called firm up limit, for example. Um, you know, you know, we all typically know the big ones, market and limit, like iceberg, stop loss order. The list goes on. And if you look and follow the financial news at all, a way so much of the financial innovation has been happening is the introduction of new complex order types. So, you know, these are just some funny uh, headlines. Simplicity is the goal of NASDAQ's new order type. And, you know, what is that order type called? Hide not slide orders. Well, hide not slide orders were slippery and hidden. Uh, SEC finds exchange over queue jumping orders. So basically, you know, you have this uh, dynamic, you know, in some sense, chaotic state space at the lowest level, the different ways you can package up your orders at the trading venues that have just become so complex. The regulators can't manage it. You have to have formal tools that can analyze what happens. So the fundamental questions we want to address here from a verification standpoint is, is your venue fair, right? And what does that mean, of course? Can you prove it? Uh, if it's not fair, how can you fix it? Can your collection of order types ever violate regulatory directives? Does your high-performance implementation conform to your high-level spec? 
Is your documentation correct? All of those are things that, that have to be addressed. And so that's uh, the core of, of what we do with Amandra applied to financial markets. And the big idea is, you know, we are uh, starting with either a design of a system or, a, you know, existing code. And we're building um, a formal mathematical model of all of the ways it can behave to the point that you could actually use it directly as the market itself if you want. So you can think about that as a digital twin, but fundamentally, we're then verifying, formally verifying this digital twin with respect to all sorts of requirements. So uh, one, just, I'll try to go through very quickly, but you can go through in more detail on our website. Case study was uh, UBS was fined $14.5 million by the SEC for issues of unfairness in their dark pool. And as things were typically done at the time, it's a kind of pre Amandra. Uh, this was found by the SEC looking through post trade data four years after the fact. Mm -hmm. They, you know, so called big data analysis, they come to uh, UBS and say, We noticed for the past four years you've been giving these bad prices. And everybody has to drop, you know, drop what they're doing. Almost certainly the people who developed that piece of code are no longer with the firm. Um, you know, it's an absolute mess. And, you know, regulatory uh, fines and, and reputation issues and so on. Um, and of course, the fact that they give people the wrong, the wrong results. So what we did was we basically, this was early days, but we built the, the way the system worked uh, and the regulatory filings were made public as part of their settlement. So that allowed us to, without issues of NDAs, build a formal model and make it public. And we did that. And our goal was really just to show UBS that these issues they were fined for um, could have been found automatically in advance. And um, this, um, and you know, we did in like 30 seconds on a laptop, you could just by analyzing the design of the system, have Imandra come back and show them sequences of events where those things they were fined for would happen. So the idea is if they used Imandra to, to analyze the design, they wouldn't be in this situation. Um, but Fundamentally, in the process, Imandra actually kicked the design back and uh, said there's a more fundamental problem. And if I just, so this is in Jupyter Notebooks, you can run this yourself if you want. I'm just effectively going to load in the model of uh, the UBS dark pool. And, let's see. and basically, you know, as, as I mentioned, um, you have. Uh, an order book that the system is maintaining. So you'll see here, these are, these are the order types supported by this trading venue. You've got market orders, limit orders, pegged orders, so-called pegged conditional indication orders. There's, you know, this is relatively small. You have trading venues with 35 of these. And of course, these interact in different ways and they affect order priority and pricing. And so fundamentally, um, the issue that Imandra found, and here's the order data types. You see it's got a lot of components. The issue that Imandra found was in the order priority determination. So this is one of the most important things where if you have a trading venue and you are um, you know, allowing people to trade on the system, well, as I mentioned, in every time step, you have to sort the order book. You have to rank the orders, and it's the top eligible buy order and the top eligible sell that can trade with each other. So to do that, you have to have a ranking function. And here was their ranking function. Of course, written in prose, you know, as these things classically were done. And uh, it starts out, you know, seems pretty innocuous, but pretty quickly it gets very complex. You know, invites are sent to the order originators of conditional indications on a priority base, first on price, second on quantity, third on time. For orders with the same price and time priority is given to resident and IOC orders over conditional indications. The whole thing, you know, in three paragraphs, describes ultimately this algorithm. There's a sort of competition between uh, between orders based upon price and time, but it's not the price that they put on the order. It's a price that's computed as a function of market data and many other things. And so then, if you think about it, well, if we're ordering an order book using that ranking function, well, what's one of the most fundamental things that that ordering has to do? It has to be transitive. If it says that order one should be ranked higher than order two, and order two should be ranked higher than order three, it better be the case that it says order one should be ranked higher than order three. 
If not, you know, you go try to sort the order book using that non-transitive relation and all bets are off. And you can actually then back out ways to game the system and jump the queue. And so, you know, one of the core things is when people define this stuff in Imandra, we check to make sure this stuff makes sense. Because, you, you know, even before you analyze more complex regulations, that relation better be transitive. So now we can just give, I'm showing you, you know, very low level, like code interface to this, but we can give Imandra this. And in Imandra, we say verify. Verify for all sides of the book, all orders, order one, order two, order three, all possible values of market data, verify that this ordering relation is transitive. And Amandra comes back very quickly, you know, and says, actually, it's not. If you have uh, orders on the buy side, and the first one is pegged, uh, a limit order pegged to near that's resident. The second one is a limit conditional indication order pegged to mid. And this next one is a peg conditional indication pegged to near that's resident. And, you know, you, all of these parameters can matter. Then ultimately, this thing is a transitive. And that, you know, it's just a fundamental sanity check that shows you that the design of this system is flawed. And, you know, not only could somebody go figure out a way to game it, but if, as soon as you have machine learning involved on the trading side, machine learning algorithm can just figure out, oh, this is a good combination of orders to use. I already, I always get filled at better prices than others. And you have to make this stuff bulletproof. Okay. I think am I pretty close on time. Uh I mean, unless people have questions in the room, we can run until noon. Oh, so okay. Think, awesome. Oh, we, we give up the room at noon? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so we might want to get to Q&A. Like another five minutes. Yeah. Okay, perfect. I'll just close out. So basically, just to give you an idea, we're, we put this all together in what we call auditing algorithms, so end-to-end -end, uh, algorithm governance. And the idea is you've got... You've got your, your formal model of the system, um, which is, you know, at its lowest level gets expressed as a piece of code in a mantra, but a mantra gives it a mathematical semantics. Um, you verify its properties, so that's really verifying the design level. Then ultimately, you can export that code to be your production system, or you could have an independent implementation. Either way, you want to use the, that verified design as the basis for your testing, as model-based testing decomposing the state space of the model to guide uh, testing. And you know, that's because you may have verified properties of this system, but it's running on an operating system that may have bugs. It's connecting to data feeds that may have issues. So you always want to have you know, testing of that implementation, even if it's using the verified code. And then finally, once it goes live, you want to take that verified design and turn it into an auditor. You know, it's really a formally verified digital twin that you want to have uh, available and always auditing every observable behavior of the production system. And that's ultimately just to kind of end with showing you what this looks like. So this is the kind of interface that, you know, Goldman Sachs or City and others use, where basically every day, uh, first of all, they get a report on, did the production system ever deviate from what the verified design said it should have done? And, and to, you know, make that possible, the the mathematical model, you know, we have to be able to turn that into a high performance simulator, high performance auditor. So that, that in itself is a lot of work. But basically, then, um, you know, if there is any deviation, so let's see here, you know, we've got this is 90, you can't see it, but okay. anyways, 99.86. So it's pretty close. But we could go zoom in and see, oh, actually, there are a few cases where the production system deviates from what the verified formal model said it should have done. And we can then actually go in and see and step through, we could go and step through all of the state changes that lead that are relevant to this deviation and that ultimately are the pieces of business logic that lead to um, the system getting a wrong result. And then fundamentally what we compute here, and this is using uh, sort of higher order version of unsat cores, if you guys are familiar with this, but basically, we're computing what we call a semantic diff, which is saying, okay, here's what the production system did. Here's what the verified formal model said it should have done. Can we minimize that difference into uh, you know, a minimal piece of the business logic, in a sense, a minimal path through the program that led to this difference? And that now tells the venue operators, it's not four years later, the SEC knocking on their door. It's at most, you know, within 24 hours, they know there was something wrong. They know where in the logic the thing went wrong, 
and you can you know go and triage that. So that's one big piece I wanted to show. And then the other, just in with this because it may be relevant um, for things that you're doing um, in assured autonomy. So the other that I mentioned is connectivity between these systems. So even if you have the system, the core complex system verified and it's operating correctly, if you are not communicating with that system appropriately, if you misunderstand each other because of different assumptions on how the communication protocol works, well, that's also a major problem. So uh, there's a lot you can do here. We have um, a language on top of Imandra called IPL, the Imandra protocol language. And the idea is, you know, classically, classically these protocol specs, it costs the, every endpoint in capital markets has customized this communication protocol. And so if you are connecting to, you know, just one of these New York Stock Exchange endpoints, you've got to go through, you know, 110 page PDF to understand how they have customized this protocol. And there's very complex logic in here. You know, this is a very complex algorithm that's being communicated and obviously over prose, you know, hundreds of pages of prose with a bunch of tables is not the right way to communicate a complex algorithm. So instead, we have a built a domain specific language on top of the mantra that allows you to very succinctly specify, in a sense, what is special? What have you customized about your version of the protocol? And this gets translated behind the scenes into, uh, into you know, uh, Imandra's logic. But the you know, fundamental thing is once we have that, it's mathematically precise. If we want to, you know, onboard a client to make sure two communication protocols are communicating appropriately, we can then go and symbolically analyze all of the unique interactions these two systems can have. We use a, a symbolic execution-based technique called rigid decomposition to do this. And then we now have a finite covering. You know, in this case, I think there's 220 cases of possible ways these two versions of the protocol can communicate. And there's regulatory requirements around testing these things. And so at Madra, you know, we can then go figure out what regions of the state space have to actually be tested to meet these regulatory requirements. And we can go synthesize the test scripts. And all of that is, you know, possible because instead of having a PDF like this, PDF like this at the heart, we make the mathematical, precise mathematical spec be the heart of it. And when you have that, then of course, all of the documentation that you want to give to people that would classically be in those PDF forms, you can derive those as verified documentation artifacts. And that's the way we really see this stuff going. You've got to have precise mathematical specs that can be formally verified that give rise to these formally verified digital twins at the core. And then all of these other artifacts that people classically would produce you know, uh, separately or even first, those are just byproducts of these formally verified pieces that are then automatically kept the same. So the, in the end, you know, one of the things this powers is we can actually have, um, you know, conversational large language model interfaces, for example, that are precise and correct because what we're doing, we're only using large language models. You know, if we have a question about how a protocol, version of the protocol works, we only use a large language model to translate between an English query and a precise logical query in a mantra. And then we have a mantra do the reasoning to give the results. And that's this, uh, we call it reasoning as a service, but that's a paradigm we're really excited about where you know, we can now start to take advantage of these new you know, LLMs that give such a fluid interface and allow people to do the equivalent of asking questions of a 200 page PDF. But we don't have to rely on, you know, ChatGPT4 to be able to reason effectively. We let the reasoning happen by a reasoning engine that can produce its results with proofs and just use the LLM to do translation between the informal and the formal. So, okay, I think I'll end there. But hopefully this gave the, the big picture that, you know, just as many of you are dealing with safety, robustness, verification of, you know, all sorts of um, safety critical systems, uh, financial markets really have many of the same problems and we can apply many of the same techniques there and there can be a great cross pollinization. Uh, hopefully, you know, you agree that it's important now that these things uh, are formally modeled and formally verified and uh, hopefully this connects to problems that you're all facing and you can see lots of analogies in there. Super, thank you. 
So I think some folks may have to may have to drop out, but we have the room for another 10 minutes anyway. And so we should use that for Q&A for sure. Uh, and can you see online? Who's, yeah. Do we have uh, questions from online? No questions online. We can start in the room and then if any come up online, we'll interrupt. But if okay, great. Uh, any questions from? Yeah. A very nice talk. Okay. I have a, a, a detailed question. Is like the is the inference performance become a consideration of the system? Are you the back end using a SM solver like this, real, or you have your own solver? Do you Great. have any real real time like solving constraint? Great question. I mean, so all, yeah, so we've developed. You know, we've been doing this about a decade, and fundamentally, when we set out to do it, we really set out to build our dream verification system. So we've been involved in ST and Z3 and others. Um, we had come, if you're familiar with the Boyer Moore world, we had really come out of ACL2, Boyer Moore Prover, which is highly automated, but is first order and untyped, but really great with induction, the idea of the automated induction. And so the sort of key, one of the key ideas of Amandra was, you know, just as Boyer Moore world is incredible for automating induction, which is needed for reasoning about programs with recursion and loops, um, and ST is fantastic at synthesizing counterexamples, among other things, but only for first order problems without recursion. And then you have the whole interactive, you know, proof assistant world of, you know, Isabel, Hall, Bean, Cock, Agda, and so on. And those systems uh, have very expressive logics, but they require, you know, they're very manual. It doesn't have much proof automation. So the idea for a mantra really from the beginning, you know, we want to have a tool that is, uh, accessible to mainstream engineers. So we made, you know, in some ways similar to uh, ACL2, we made the logic of programming language. So your artifacts you're reasoning about are at the lowest level of camel programs. But then we took a lot of the core ideas of Boyer Moore, and which only had uh, worked, you know, been done for untyped first order logic. We lifted those to higher order typed logic. And similarly for SMT, we took SMT, which you know, was for first order monomorphic logic without recursion. And we lifted that to higher order logic with recursion. So in a mantra, you know, just to show you simple things, like if I define a little list, list reverse function, let's say, you know, just writing code for it. This is, you know, valid OCaml. I'm writing a recursive function to reverse a list. If it's empty, I return an empty list. Otherwise, if I hadn't have a head and a tail, I reverse the X's and append that to the singleton list of the tail. So that's just a program, you know, I can just run it, but I can also reason about it. So I can say, for example, you know, verify reverse of X is not equal to, you know, one, four, six, something like that. And Imandra comes back and says, you know, that's not true. Obviously, if I have the list six, four, one, and I reverse it, you get what you think. So you can think about that as being SMT like, but it was SMT modular recursion. And it's dealing with, you know, recursive data types and recursive function. And you can also do it higher order. So, for example, I might say, you know, verify for all functions f and for all lists x. If I map f over the reverse of x, I don't get one, two, three, for example. So this is now a higher order goal. And so again, this is a lifting of SMT to this higher order setting. So not only was it higher order, it was also polymorphic. So we synthesize a type t, we synthesize a function. F and which was a functional parameter to the goal, and we synthesize a list, and the list has elements of that you know type that we defined, and this originally was you know uh, a variable here that was polymorphic, and again these are all first class objects, so I can compute with them. So I can say you know cx dot x, that is that list. I can map you know cx dot f over the reverse of cx dot x, and get out one two three and. So anyway, so to your point, we, we build on all of these things, um, but to, to make it all work together, we've had to generalize a lot and combine them. And I'll just show you the last pieces. If we actually say, try to prove something true, you know, like reverse reverse of X is equal to X. So by default in a monitor, you mentioned bounded model checking. By default, the way I like to work is do bounded model checking first. So basically that means first check, before you really go try to prove something for all possible cases, Check it up to a bound because most of the time you're going to have counterexamples. You're going to be wrong. And those counterexamples are within small bounds. 
But this is now something that's true. And so the way I'm, I've set my system up is I ask it first to verify up to a bound. And it says there's no counterexamples up to this bound. And there's a precise meaning to that. You can turn that into a verification result. But now that there's no counterexamples, now I have conviction that the thing is true. So now I'm going to ask a monitor to use its automated induction techniques to go prove this. And now, you know, you'll see this is the kind of thing that would be very manual, typically, in an interactive proof assistant. We have do actually two inductions here. Um, and to be able to automate the inductive proofs, figure out the right induction schemes, do all the simplification, that's where we've taken a lot of the boyer more ideas and lifted those, but combined them with this lifted higher order version of SMT so we could do things like, you know, eliminate false generalizations before an induction. Stuff like that. Yes. Hopefully that answered you. Yeah, yeah, thanks for your clear demonstration. I, I'm very excited because your tools shared many interests, the same motivation of the, the research in our lab, but also recently high order programs as with a counter example generations. And so we also, we're targeting a untyped language, but we can write the property of a type declaration. Nice. Yeah, I'm expecting to chat with you in private in the afternoon. I have already reserved some. Oh, good. Okay, awesome. Now, so we have an HCAR 2020 paper on this core lifting to higher order, SMT yeah. to higher order. Which we're also working on the, bringing the higher order program, but using our SMT backend. Awesome. Okay, I look forward to the meeting. There's a question online. Oh, sure. I don't know if you can pull it up or I can read it out. And then you have a question behind you, too. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, outstanding talk. Tesla's getting ready to release FSD12, a neural network planner that decides what kind of actions to take based on its training. How do you apply formal methods to that? Are there potentially safety pitfalls that will go undiscovered until the conditions present themselves in the bot? Fantastic question. Very much an open question. Um, you know, I will show you, if you want to see some of the stuff we're doing in the neural network verification world, if you go to our docs, um, Imondra Core is the name of our core reasoning engine. So it's so hard to see it here, but you go to examples. Um, yeah, analyzing machine learning models. And basically, this is a notebook on different ways that you can import neural networks or you know, random forests, different machine learning, you know, very much opaque, huge collections of coefficients, uh, machine learned models into a mantra and then reason about them. And, you know, this goes through, for example, um, this first one is an, uh, an oncology model that's taking sensor readings about um, uh, a skin lesion and trying to decide if it's likely malignant or benign. And you can then, you know, once you basically import this as a formal model in a mantra, now you can start to ask questions. So you might ask it, you know, a sanity question at first, like, is there an input into the system that would uh, give the result benign? Instance in a mantra, you're querying for, is there an input that causes something to happen? And, you know, system comes back and gives you an example, but you see you have these negative values for radius and compactness. You have things that, you know, you stare at it for a minute, you realize this doesn't make physical sense. But that tells you, oh, perhaps this system is, is always going to give benign when you, when you have things that are you know, physically unrealizable. And you can then add side conditions. You, know, you can define a predicate for what does it mean for an input to be valid? What does it mean for it to be physically realizable? And ask the same thing and now start to get out results that make a lot more sense. Really reduce your analysis to the sort of physically real. Thing. And then you can start to ask sanity questions like, you know, for example, if you have a valid input and uh, its concavity mean is greater than or equal to 0 0.4 and some other, you know, bounds hold on the input, will this always return malignancy, for example? And, you know, this is the kind of thing you can prove. So you can verify domain specific properties. Um, and of course, depending on the size of the network, this, you know, this stuff becomes harder. Um, but that, you know, that's one way I think that this, this stuff can be very valuable. You can also use this technique of region decomposition to decompose state spaces and say things like, you know, show me all of the regions of behavior of this neural network where it will return malignant, for example, and get out descriptions of those. And there's a lot you can do based on that. Yeah. So anyways, so just to say, I think in principle, there's a lot that can be done. 
it's always fundamentally very difficult to figure out what are the right verification statements um, to have about these things, especially classifiers. Uh, but many of the same techniques, you know, if it comes to a controller, many of the same techniques that we use to, uh, to analyze handwritten controllers, um, we can apply to, to learned controllers or controllers with learned components. They're just programs that are, you know, especially opaque to look at. Uh, and one, one more piece I'll just mention, there is a sort of, um, you know, area of formal verification that, that's becoming, as you can imagine, more exciting um, called formal verification of neural networks, and there's competitions for it. And there are a bunch of solvers that are coming out that are designed for analyzing different kinds of neural networks. One that's very good out of Stanford and uh, Hebrew University in Israel is Maribu. And, um, but you have a sort of zoo of these as people are developing new techniques. And one of the things we've been involved in is basically these systems are trying to be high performance over very large networks. So they use floating point. They, you know, often they're written in, you know, C++, for example. And uh, it's possible for these verifiers to make mistakes. So now these systems like Maribu, they're actually exporting independently checkable proof objects. And we've built a formally verified proof checker in Amandra for that. Um, so there is, find it. Uh, yeah, so this is a, a paper on this towards a certified proof checker for deep neural network verification. The idea is all of these different tools that are good for different aspects of neural network verification, they should export, you know, they can have lots of amazing things in how they find the proof, but they should export proofs in this format. And then there's a, you know, a proof checker, independent open source proof checker, verified to be correct in a mantra that you can use to check all their proofs. And that's found, you know, lots of problems so far in proofs that some of the systems have admitted. Um, okay, sorry, long answer to your question, but there's a lot there. We should uh, probably uh, take that as the last question. And if there's any more conversation, maybe we can take it in the hallway there. Or if you want to sign up, um, I don't know no, if I we have signed up already. You have signed up already? Oh, okay, fabulous. I didn't want to. So, so thank you so much, Grant. This has obviously generated a lot of interest.